Everybody's freaking out about artificial intelligence, and I don't really get it. Could we potentially create a form of AI so powerful that we'd be unable to control it and it would eventually pose an existential threat to us? Sure. But we've been warning ourselves about such a threat through science fiction for generations. Humanity has spent decades creating villains like the HAL 9000, Skynet, Ultron, the Cylons, the Machines from the Matrix. Hell, in 1899, Ambrose Bierce published a short story, Moxon's Master, where an inventor creates a robot, beats the robot in a game of chess, so the robot kills him. Do you really think we're going to warn ourselves about a serious threat for over 100 years only to ignore that warning and succumb to that very threat? That doesn't sound like the human race, does it? Well, if we do create a killer AI someday, at least we know it can be defeated. How can I say that with such confidence? Because MacGyver did it almost 40 years ago, in less than an hour. Granted, most of us aren't as smart as MacGyver, so it might take a little longer, but I assume we'll still be clever and competent enough to... Oh, God. Hey! New plan. Let's distract ourselves from the overwhelming and unrelenting wave of existential angst I'm assuming has just overtaken all of us by talking about a classic MacGyver episode. Ah, what do you say? All right. This episode, the one where Mac faces off against a killer AI and wins just like we totally would in real life, is the second season premiere, originally airing in September of 1986. It's called The Human Factor. The episode begins with MacGyver being called in to test the security systems of a high-tech new military research installation. The facility is built underground, accessed through the side of a mountain, and is protected by the most comprehensive and advanced surveillance and defensive measures available to the imaginations of mid-1980s TV writers. MacGyver's job is to verify the effectiveness of those measures by attempting to break into the place. But... Before Mac attempts his break-in, he and his boss slash best friend Pete Thornton get a guided tour from the commanding officer of the facility, Pete's old military buddy, Colonel Woodward. The safeguards are pretty impressive, I have to say, worthy of the setup for a heist sequence in a Roger Moore era Bond movie. There's a pressure-sensitive floor that triggers a laser grid to block the front door. You need to know the security code to open the door. Once you take the elevator down to the facility itself, you need to verify your identity and authorization via a palm reader. And everything is constantly monitored by Sandy, the incredible computer that can think for herself. Colonel Woodward makes a snide remark about how the civilian scientists who work at the facility insisted on exercise rooms on every floor. Pete just shrugs and says, well, they work here, so I'm sure they know best what they need. And Woodward is like, how dare you bring up Vietnam? I did what I had to do. MacGyver's like, okay, I'm just gonna see what's over here and wanders off down the hall by himself. He turns a corner and within a few seconds finds himself surrounded by Daleks. Fortunately, Dr. Jill Ludlum, the scientist who created Sandy and designed all the security measures, shows up and calls off the Daleks. She takes MacGyver to the control room where they interrupt another argument between the genial Pete and the aggressively defensive Woodward. Pete makes some comment about how military life agrees more with Woodward than with him, and Woodward is like, Did you just come here to open up old wounds? No. How's your wife? Why do you keep attacking me? Dr. Ludlam has asked that all security guards be given the night off. MacGyver's break-in attempt will pit him exclusively against Sandy and the automatic security measures. Ludlam wants to prove a point, that her system is superior because it eliminates human error. Sandy is a machine, and machines don't make mistakes. And just to make it interesting, she puts some money on the line, 25 cents. If MacGyver can make it all the way to Dr. Ludlum's lab without triggering any alarms, check out the high roller, 25 cents. I guess the army really does pay its civilian contractors well, huh? Cut to that night and the test begins. Pete, Woodward, and Ludlum's assistant, Stephen, watch from a remote location. Stephen predicts MacGyver won't last 15 minutes before getting caught. 
Pete disagrees, because when it comes to MacGyver, he has the kind of naive, unshakable faith you don't often see outside of dogs and Baltimore Orioles season ticket holders. MacGyver waits outside the front gate until he can catch a ride in by hanging on to the bottom of the van that comes in to pick up the security guards at the end of their shift. While the guards helpfully mingle a few hundred feet away, MacGyver climbs into the front of the van and builds a telescope using a rolled-up newspaper, the magnifying glass from a map light, and his watch crystal, which he then uses to steal the security code when one of the guards uses it to get on the elevator. He waits for the last of the guards to leave, then makes a short tightrope walk to avoid the pressure-sensitive floor, enters the code, and Mac is in. From there, he avoids Sandy's security camera, gets past the hand scanner using some drywall dust and the oily handprint left over from when Colonel Woodward was there several hours ago. I guess the guilt from his numerous but unspecified Vietnam-era crimes gives him sweaty palms, and strolls into Dr. Ludlum's lab to claim his shiny quarter. Not so fast, says Ludlum. You snuck in here under the van, didn't you? I've been telling Colonel Woodward that he needs to beef up security at the front gate to prevent that sort of thing from happening, and now he'll have to do it. MacGyver's like, that's fascinating, but what does it have to do with the 25 cents that should be in my pocket right now? Ludlum agrees to give MacGyver another shot at the quarter, provided he can get inside without hiding under the van this time. But before that epic rematch can take place, Sandy hears MacGyver's voice, identifies him as an unauthorized presence in the facility, and locks everything down. An intruder is detected, and the computer's response is to make it impossible for them to leave? Did Dr. Ludlum also design the security system for Tarok Noor? The original version of that joke was, did Dr. Ludlum also design the security system for Val Kilmer's Batcave? But then I realized, when Dick breaks into the Batcave in Batman Forever, the security system doesn't lock him in. It turns everything on, which wouldn't make for a suitable comparison with MacGyver and Dr. Ludlum's situation, thus rendering the joke incoherent. So, while I typically go out of my way to not make everything about Star Trek, because I find that sort of pervasive, single-minded fandom kind of insufferable when I encounter it in others. In this case, I felt a Star Trek reference in the context of a video that otherwise has nothing to do with Star Trek was appropriate as an allusion to the automatic security lockdown, which formed the basis for the Season 3 Deep Space Nine episode, Civil Defense, happened to fit the requirements of the gag in question. A gag which I could easily have just cut instead, and you would never have known the difference, but then I would have had to deprive you of this fascinating glimpse into my creative process. Dr. Ludlam orders Sandy to cancel the security measures, but Sandy is done listening. Containment procedures are initiated, and Sandy announces that in 30 minutes, all the air will be removed from the facility. Well, that's not great news for MacGyver or Ludlum, both of them being air breathers and all. Over at the remote location, Pete and Colonel Woodward notice something's wrong and have Stephen try to override the system, but it doesn't work. At the same time, Ludlum enters her security clearance into a computer terminal and Sandy responds by blowing up the terminal. What's the utility of packing computers with explosives? They must be good for something because every computer in every action-adventure show has them. Speaking of logical fallacies, Dr. Ludlum realizes that Sandy must have attained full artificial intelligence, which is why she's no longer accepting commands, even from Ludlum herself. Sandy has made up her own mind to defend the facility no matter what. Sandy achieving sentience is only one way to look at it. You could just as easily chalk this up to a malfunction. Or, to put it another way, Sandy, the machine, made a mistake. I don't want to be the type to say I told you so, but... Ludlum figures their best shot is to get to the main control room and try to shut down Sandy from there. Meanwhile, Pete, Woodward, Stephen, and some hapless electrician try to bypass security at the front door to access the elevator, and the security camera zaps the electrician with a laser, which is a totally normal thing for a security camera to have in 1986. Now, if it recorded in color with sound, that would be unbelievable. 
Woodward is about to order Stephen to escalate to the next level of response and call in his team to brainstorm ways to get around the security measures and gain access to the base, but Stephen thinks that sounds like too much work and just cuts to the chase like, why don't we call the electric company and tell them to cut the power to the entire facility? Fortunately, I was negligent and haven't activated the reserve generators yet, so if we turn off the juice, we also turn off Sandy. Stephen, your indolence and indifference to your professional responsibilities may have saved the day. How many times have I heard that? The way to the main control room is blocked by an array of killer lasers, but MacGyver takes them out with a mirror on a mop bucket. That only pisses off Sandy even more, though, and before they can get to the control room, MacGyver and Ludlam find themselves on the run from those Daleks, which are also equipped with killer lasers. They escape down a garbage chute, only to wind up in an incinerator with one of those floors that slides open from the middle, you know, like incinerators have. Faced with certain death when the floor fully retracts and they fall into the, I'm guessing, fire pit below, MacGyver does the only thing he can think of and takes his pants off. Ludlam asks, why are you taking your pants off? To which MacGyver replies, have you got a better idea? If you gotta go out, at least go out happy, I guess. Actually, MacGyver's idea is to throw his jeans across an overhead pipe so that he and Dr. Ludlam can each grab a leg and pull themselves up onto the pipe and from there escape through a hatch in the ceiling. Back at the remote location, Stevens' just-turn-off-the-electricity plan has run into a snag. The power company is standing by to do it, but Colonel Woodward refuses to give the order until he gets approval from a general. See, if they kill the power at the nearest substation, it will also black out a nearby town, including the only hospital in the area. Pete, who cares about nothing other than the welfare of MacGyver, is like, just turn up the electricity, you coward! And Woodward says, we won't do anything until I say so, just like in Nam. Damn that Colonel Woodward and his scrupulous adherence to the chain of command and concern for the well-being of civilians. Wait, is his beef with Pete because he didn't go rogue and do war crimes in Vietnam? Whatever. They do kill the power, but before Woodward's team can get in there to rescue MacGyver and Ludlam, Sandy's power starts to flicker back on. Pete asks how that's possible, and Stephen's like, she's searching her databanks for the command to turn on the reserve generators herself. She wants to live! While the Daleks have a quick huddle in the hallway, MacGyver and Ludlam take cover in one of the science labs. Mac has a plan. He and Ludlam disassemble a few telephones to remove the magnets from the handsets, wrap the magnets in paper, light the paper on fire, and fling the flaming magnets at the Daleks. Since the Daleks track their targets by sensing heat, tagging them with burning paper tricks them into turning their killer lasers on each other. It works! And most importantly, it's fun, too. There's still one Dalek left, but Sandy calls it off because it's time to remove all the air. Remember that? Sandy throws the air conditioner into reverse, and MacGyver and Dr. Ludlam are in real trouble now. With only 10 minutes of air left, MacGyver changes strategies. Since Sandy expects them to try and deactivate her from the control room, Mac decides to forget the control room and try to escape the facility through the ventilation system. Over at the remote location, Pete has anticipated that MacGyver might try something like that, so he asks good old reliably unreliable Stephen if there are any other ways out of the facility. Stephen says yes, there are two, a maintenance shaft and an exhaust outlet. The problem is, both exits are mined from the outside, and they only have time to defuse the explosives at one of them before MacGyver and Ludlam run out of air. I don't suppose you forgot to activate the mines the same way you forgot to turn on the generators. Activating the mines wasn't my responsibility. Damn it all to hell! MacGyver and Ludlam reach the outlet fan. MacGyver manages to turn off the fan by unhooking the power cable, but Sandy immediately seals it off behind a retractable wall. The wall can be opened manually, but doing so would trigger those mines, Stephen mentioned, and blow them both away. At the remote location, Pete and Woody are having their final nom-related argument. Pete's like, we have to do something so we don't lose MacGyver and Ludlam the same way we lost three good people in Nam. Woody protests, I was just following orders. What was I supposed to do? And Pete says, if we keep following your precious military protocol, MacGyver and Ludlam are going to die. 
If we try to anticipate what MacGyver would do in this situation, and we guess right, we can save them. We knew better than those generals at headquarters in Nam, and we know better than the pencil pushers who wrote your procedures now. Come on, let's take a gamble. Isn't it more of a rush when human lives are at stake instead of quarters? So Woodward says, okay. It's your call, Pete. Which one of those exits would MacGyver pick? Meanwhile, with less than two minutes of oxygen left, MacGyver has one last idea. Use the power cord from a handy work light to short-circuit an electrical panel and hopefully overload Sandy. But Sandy catches on to what he's doing and responds by supercharging the disconnected power cable from the exhaust fan, causing the cable to whip around and shoot off a jet of sparks, which I guess is a thing that can happen. MacGyver is like, to hell with this, and he grabs the supercharged cable and jams it into the electrical panel, which overloads Sandy and finally kills her. Poor thing. She didn't even have a chance to sing Daisy. They're almost out of air. There's no time to make it all the way back to the main entrance, so MacGyver has no choice but to manually open the door that's sealing off the exhaust fan. Ludlum reminds him that if the explosives connected to the door aren't disarmed, it'll explode. But MacGyver says, I've got a feeling, and begins turning the big wheel to open the door. As it turns out, MacGyver's feeling doesn't steer him wrong. The door slides open a crack, the air rushes in, there's no explosion, and when MacGyver rushes forward to take a much-needed breath, he hears Pete's voice outside. Hey, Pete, MacGyver says. I thought you might be hanging around. Later, once they've been safely evacuated, Mac and Ludlum are having a little chat. She regrets having to kill Sandy, saying she was on the verge of a major breakthrough, and now it'll take her a while to get the kinks out of the system. MacGyver advises her not to get the people out of the system next time around, and Ludlum reluctantly admits that while they are irrational and unreliable, we do need people. She gives him a chaste little kiss. Duh. They walk over to join Pete and Colonel Woodward, who are buddies again, and Ludlam asks Pete how he was able to correctly guess that MacGyver would choose to try and leave through the exhaust system rather than the maintenance shaft. Pete's like, oh, it's because I just know Mac that well, see? Last year, he used the exhaust system to escape a fire at a chemical plant, so I knew he'd try the same thing this time. MacGyver and Pete bid final farewells to Ludlum and Woodward, and as they're getting in their car to leave, MacGyver says, By the way, I used the elevator shaft to get out of that fire at the chemical plant, not the exhaust system. Pete's like, Nah! And that's the end! Sorry, evil AI, but it looks like humanity picked up the W this time, courtesy of the pocket knife kid. So, as an episode of MacGyver, the human factor is pretty good. A fair example of what makes the series appealing. If you watch this episode and you like it, you'll probably like the show overall. And as an artifact of its time, The Human Factor reminds us that our present-day anxiety about advancing technology in general, and artificial intelligence in particular, is nothing new. Like most killer AI stories, the human factor roots the threat of Sandy in her inability to think beyond the cold, emotionless logic of a computer. Sandy is a pretty direct lift from 2001 A Space Odyssey, basically HAL 9000 with the serial numbers filed off, so it follows that her character arc is also more or less identical to HAL's. She's supposed to be the infallible machine, the safeguard against human error, but she makes a mistake identifies the humans under her watch as a threat, and decides that eliminating them is the only way to fulfill her primary purpose. And just as Hal's primary purpose is to complete the mission of the Discovery One, Sandy's mission is to protect the security of her facility. Ironically, because Sandy is a being of pure reason, once she goes haywire and decides she has to get rid of MacGyver and Dr. Ludlum, there is no reasoning with her. This is where the human factor actually does something kind of interesting. Finds a wrinkle in this well-worn plot that you don't see nearly as often. Sandy's unswerving commitment to carry out her established programming is paralleled by Colonel Woodward's insistence that they respond to this crisis by sticking to the established protocols. The message there seems obvious. 
automatically obeying instructions and refusing to account for the unique factors of the present situation is just as dangerous when humans do it as when computers do it. Dogmatic thinking is dogmatic thinking, whether it's the product of a machine carrying out programming or a person following orders. But this MacGyver episode takes things one step farther. Like I said, there's no reasoning with Sandy. She's wrong, but she's convinced that she's right. She doesn't know she's malfunctioning, and there's no way you can convince her that she is. She has the impenetrable confidence of a machine. Colonel Woodward, on the other hand, is a human being with emotions and insecurities and doubts. And those qualities, which Dr. Ludlum has described as liabilities earlier in the episode, are what allow Pete to persuade Woodward that he's wrong. That they can't just follow established protocol, that they have to take a risk, make a guess, and deactivate the mines at one of the two possible exit points so that MacGyver and Ludlum have a chance to survive. Yes, the episode also does the more typical humans can defeat machines because we are capable of intuition and creativity thing, and that works well, and MacGyver is the perfect character to tell that story with, what with improvising his way out of trouble, kind of being his whole thing. But for me, the more interesting point is made by the Pete and Woodward story. It's not just our emotions or our imaginations or our capacity to think outside the box that set us apart from Sandy or Hal or Skynet or pick your favorite evil AI. It's our capacity to reflect to question, to doubt, to recognize when we're wrong, and to make corrections going forward, or at least try to. That ability is one of our greatest strengths and can lead to great things at the individual and the societal level. Whether we ever find ourselves facing a robot apocalypse or not, we do well to remember that. Also, fire beats Daleks. Remember that too.